Thank you for joining me as I sit down with Pastor David and Marie Rosales from Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, as we discuss marriage, raising children, and managing difficulties that arise in the family. We're ready to begin, so let's talk marriage. So what would be the, the wife's role in focusing their marriage on the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, I think that we need to die to ourselves completely. I mean, because in marriage, you, you, that's part of, of, of what we need to do is to die to one another, or not to die to one another, but to die to ourselves in the marriage. And um, if you want to live a pure life for the Lord, you, you, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you and rely on the Holy Spirit. That's, um, and and um, I may think that I'm right in one issue with my husband, and I could be very adamant about it. But where will that get me if we start? If I start an argument, um, that that would not edify our our, our marriage at, at all. Nope. At all, and. Um, I think it's really all about dying to ourselves. I really do, and and, um, and and allowing the spirit to direct us. And there are times when we just have to keep our mouth shut. And I think a lot of women don't. They keep rambling on, maybe uh, to their husbands at times. And uh, there's times that we just need to be be quiet, and 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 go to the Lord in prayer. Is that difficult at times? I think it can be. It can be, but it's a good thing to go to the Lord in prayer, because uh, um, that's where we should be D doing doing that all the time. Any anyway, John. Um, um, so I, I would say. You know, my wife does, Marie. When we get in a disagreement, and it seems like we try, there can be times where we one up each other, that have to be right mentality. Uh, sometimes my wife will turn to me and go. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm biting my tongue because I don't want to say anything, oh, you know, to start something. Funny. And so, uh, we practice that a lot. And it, but it's difficult at times being able to uh, just bite our lip, you know, and to bring glory and honor to the Lord. It can be a challenge. But you, I, and I don't have to do it. Much. I mean, that, that that doesn't happen <laughs> in our family now. But I think when I was younger, because. Because you're beginning to know their ways, and you really don't know them until you get married, you know, start getting married, and <laughs> that's, that's and then you become accustomed to things. Then I know what I'm, how my tone may, may sound to him when I was younger. I didn't realize that you know I maybe sounded a little bossy, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> but not, not not any longer. I, well, We've learned each do, other's yeah, ways. What I would do when Marie started sounding bossy, like she said, you know, and of course that happens in every relationship, but I was more sensitive to that. That was one of the, my trigger, those things would trigger me. I did not like that. And I just didn't, you know, so yeah. So mm -hmm. if Marie had a tone at all, at first I'd look at her and I'd say, are you sure you want to go there? You know, are you sure you want to go there? Because if you speak to me like that, I am going to respond. That's kind of how I was. I said, I am going to respond. Now, if you want to go there, I'm more than willing. But if you want to have a conversation, be very careful. See, so again, I came from an aggressive background. I was very direct. And now I don't, but that's early days, mm -hmm. you know, and I, because I was, we were trying to figure out how we're going to make this work. What Marie did, to our blessing, to our blessing, is instead of saying, who do you think you are? Which she did think that. She would think that. <laughs> she was she was in her mind. She told me that. I did. Said, you know what I'm thinking. I just didn't yeah. say it. <laughs> she just wouldn't say anything. Because she, she just, who do you think you are? But the wisdom of that, in our case was that I began to realize there are better ways to say what I'm saying. Because again, I came from a very aggressive background, which was normal. It was normal to speak like that. 
Marie came from a softer background. So we learned, we learned. And, we really did. And so after all these years, John, I mean, it's not that she and I have just one brain. You know, we all, we think the same and, you know, we, you know we're different. Mm -hmm. But what we've learned to do is we've learned to take our own personalities and submit them to our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I still can. I still can say, are you sure you want to go there? But it's not like it used to be. And she'll look at me. She'll go, "No, nah, I, I, you know, because it's we're not. We're not gonna. We're not gonna have a, a discussion that's that's leading us to anything that could be, you know, anger. We're not gonna go there, mm -hmm. you know. So let's just deal with this. What is it? Okay. Sometimes Mama doesn't want to hear it. Sometimes I don't feel like hearing it. So we learn, <laughs> right? I right. mean, so that. But that, that that again goes under the umbrella of of wanting to, you know, seek peace. That's you know, right. the, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, I, I believe Christianity is very practical, mm -hmm. very practical. You know, it, it, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus, some lawyer asked, right? And love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, in some, in some religious beliefs, loving God with everything is their whole quest, right? right. So Jesus says, no, nah, that's... The, you have to love God, and John says, how can you love God who is invisible, whom you've not seen, and you hate your brother whom you have seen? So Christianity is practical. You know, if I really love this invisible God whom I do not see, what's the best way for me to demonstrate that I have a love for this invisible God? By loving people. And who is the closest person in my circle of people? My wife. And so that's why... Paul would be talking, that's part of why Paul would be saying, you know, husbands, love your wives. Because the wife is not commanded to love the husband. The husband is commanded to love the wife. And the wife shows her love by her respect for that man. So that man ought to see that as an incentive to be worthy of her respect because he wants her love. And so for me... I made up my mind, and I think every man ought to do this, to be the man that she respects more than any other man on the planet. And that sounds almost aggressively arrogant. But no, I don't want her ever to, to regard another man as being better than me or greater than me. I don't. That's my quest. And I think I've succeeded, yeah. you know, because for her, she, that just shows she... She doesn't, you know, have high standards. But, for, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's how it works, John. If you want to be Liv's hero, that's what you ought to be. She ought to say, there's not a man on this planet that is greater than my man. You know, there are, that's the way you ought to be. She ought to look at you and say, he's the best dad. He's the best husband. He's the best believer. Now that's worthy. Now that's something that matters. And that's what produces a legacy for your babies. Mm -hmm. Because one day they'll say, this is my dad. And my dad loved my mom. My dad loved us. And my dad especially loved his God. Mm -hmm. If you have that, what else do you need? Right. right? Practical, right? So practical. It's just practical. And our children know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, yeah they... The church knows that. You know, the church sees this. A uh, little fun food for thought for the couples who are watching. You know, there are sometimes, and I want to come back and revisit this. This will be just a fun portion of this. With my wife and I, there's things that I do that bother her. I'll leave the toothpaste cap off the toothpaste. And she'll like, put the toothpaste cap back on. Or there might be uh, just one little piece of toilet paper on the toilet paper ring and not changed out, or there may be a little bit of milk left in the jug, you know, in the refrigerator. What were some of the things, those kind of those funny quirks that would uh, not upset you guys, but just like, wow, why, why do that? You know, are there anything like that as you guys were getting to know each other earlier in your marriage? That's yep. hard. That's really hard. And I'll tell you two reasons why. One, it, it requires me to actually have to retrieve a long, <laughs> long history, right? <laughs> and that, that, you know, because when we first got married, 
you know, and first, you know, I'll have to think about it. But two, um, and this may not make sense, John, it may not. I, I grew up as a young man saying that the only thing I ever really want to talk about with my wife is how good she is. I, I don't talk about private things that may irritate me. I just don't. So that's not something that I'm comfortable even addressing. Because uh, I, I don't want people to think any less of her than, right. than she is. And, and I'm, I'm very sincere about that. And so I will play with her, as you see sometimes from the pulpit. I'll tease her as she's sitting in front of me. I'll tease her. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is a glimpse of my playfulness with my wife. But I, I don't want people to know anything about her that, that in any way um, makes her less than what she is. I, I'm very private about that, and so if you want to say something about me, that's fine. But I, I don't. I don't no, it's I okay. We can just stop. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> I, I just think if I could, even like to my parents, my uh, they would go back and forth, not in like a upset way, but little quirks that I noticed that would uh, that would bother my dad or bother my mom. And then I see some of those things, like for example, my my wife may leave a cup out because she's going to refill it with water. Right away, I put it away. And then she's looking for it. Where's my cup? I put <laughs> well, it away. That's yeah, funny. I'm her helper. I, I call her. That's true. I, I, I will say that to her. I'll, she'll say, where's my... And I'll go, I'm helping you. That is And sometimes my wife will say, I don't need that, true. right? Yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> And so helper. there's uh, things like that that I find are interesting in marriages yeah. because it's those oh, little things yeah, 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 yeah. that we yeah. have. You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, Paul instructs the husband, let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. What does that word render refer to as? The husband has certain responsibilities. And Paul is making it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that he's to fulfill certain responsibilities. And rendering is, is basically just yielding to or giving to her giving her something that is, uh, the, another version speaks of due benevolence, you know, that he is to render to her proper affection. And in its context, at least through the, um, through the uh, commentators that I've been influenced by, it's referring to the physical relationship in the marriage and that it, it, it gives us the insight that the woman, his wife, um, has certain needs, you know, emotional, physical, spiritual needs. And um, part of her needs as a woman is a proper sense of beauty and uh, the husband's desire. And so he is to give to her what is necessary for her in a sexual fashion, as well as in the spiritual and the emotional. There should be, in other words, a, a unity of expression that he sees her as a complete person. And sometimes a husband may not be rendering to her the due benevolence, the things that are hers, including the the physical elements of marriage. You know, the the, the sexual um, pleasures that 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 a woman rightly should have with her husband. Um, one of the things I would say that really affected the church for a long time was the um, the thought that physical pleasure in a marriage was actually immoral or. Mm -hmm or dirty. You know, I can remember my mother told me that the first sin, this is before she became a Christian, this is when I was a little boy. She said, well, the first sin was sexual intercourse. That's what my mom taught me. So in my mom's way of thinking, sexual intercourse was actually the first sin that Adam and Eve ever had, which of course was not true. And somewhere she had been taught that probably from one of my crazy aunts, because I had some <laughs> crazy aunts who really were um, just really interesting. And so mama taught me that. And so I grew up with a, an improper attitude towards physical relationships. I didn't, I didn't know the value of them in scripture. I didn't know the purpose of them in the expression of, I didn't know any of that. And so I had to find that out through, um, through practically applying the aspects of being a husband um, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, to learn what tenderness is, to learn what cherishing is, to learn what, um, what dying to self is, 
things like that. That that's all part of your 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 physical relationship, because a lot of men um, see it as about themselves, you know, achieving a certain goal that they have, mm -hmm. uh, to the to the um, neglect of their wife's needs, and so you render to your wife due benevolence, because the whole context speaks about that that they're. If there is a time that they're to be apart, that it should be for spiritual reasons, to give yourself over to, to prayer, and then come again, he says, together, lest you be tempted. So he, he's acknowledging the reality of physical need in that passage. But the wife is actually being elevated in a place that, that during that day, uh, people wouldn't even have understood, which is Paul saying, you know, that that's, that woman has needs just like you have needs. And instead of you using her for your own pleasure, you ought to render to her that which is due to her, that this is an enjoyable experience, not simply the procreation, though that's an aspect of it, but the unity and unifying of lovers. You know, the way Song of Solomon speaks concerning the pleasures that you sat, you're satisfied in at the proper time. And so when Paul is speaking and concerning that, he's making it clear, at least in that passage, that sexual play, sexual intercourse, is, is, is not immoral. It's only wrong when, uh, one, when it's outside of marriage, it is wrong always, no matter how pleasurable it may be to those participating, it is wrong because it's uh, not in the covenant of marriage and it's called fornication or adultery, but it's also something that is, is um, to be uh, representative of true pure love, you know, with the purpose of enjoying each other uh, because God created us to fulfill one another and one another's needs. And so we somehow made it dirty. And yet I, I've seen the... Um, studies where uh, it, it's been demonstrated that married couples uh, under the surveys at least that I've seen uh, express greater satisfaction in their physical relationships than the single couples do and uh, there's a, a variety of obvious reasons for that but you know you have a wife and therefore your wife is available to you uh, much of the time whereas if you're single and you're not living together and all of that well they're going to be different levels of relationship but but when you have a good marriage it's going to include you know the emotional it's going to include the spiritual obviously and it will include the physical because it's all part of the package because that's how god created us and so again husbands are commanded to render due benevolence meaning this is something not about you this is something about you together and your wife deserves to be respected and to be loved not to be used not to be experimented on <laughs> right because some men experiment on the way they look at porn and before you know it they're trying to act out what they saw on that on that uh, the pornography that they were watching or they talk to some some trashy friend <laughs> in a in a locker room and before you know it he's telling her because that's kind of telling him how to do things right. That's I at the age of fourteen. Uh, I heard that in in the high school gym, the older boys were saying things that that's I, I'd never heard some of the things that I can remember them saying, but it sticks in your mind and you start thinking, well, that's how you treat women. When in fact, you know, my dad never spoke to me about that in his life. My dad never spoke to me. That was one of those taboo private yeah. conversations. <laughs> yes. He never said yeah, a thing to me. So you kind of pick it up from your friends or whatever means is available, and you end up um, growing up thinking that that uh, physical relationships are, are really about you. It's how you feel, uh, what you got away with, and who you can tell later on. That's kind of how it works. And then you get married, and you treat your wife like she's one of the girls you hooked up with mm -hmm. at a bar, and she's feeling used and dirty, because you're not respecting her and you're, you're not caring about her. And uh, I learned a long time ago uh, that, that love making actually begins in the morning when you wake up and you say, good morning, baby, I love you. 
and and it may be consummated later on um, through a physical act. But lovemaking began long before you were involved in any any intimacy. It, it began yeah. it began with just hi mama, I love you. That's her. That's it. It's it's. I think that John. I think that much of what people characterize as 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 love is lust, and it's just it's just using each other. I really do, and I think you're making a big mistake if you think that uh, that having uh, physical intimacy resulting in in a satisfaction to yourself is actually loving that woman. <laughs> but a false pretense. It's always unsatisfying. Yeah, because you're always looking for more, wanting more. What about, Pastor, because you're mentioning that, for the person that says, well, you know, I just don't feel like it, whether it's the husband having that attitude, whether it's rendering the physical, the spiritual, or the emotional aspect of the relationship, I, I don't feel like treating her nicer. I don't feel like, you know. Or when the woman says, I don't feel like having intercourse, you know, or whatever, you know. Um, as a woman, I'm sure Marie could add, and she has, she has in the past, she has made statements that to, to the ladies that I think is very beneficial for them, you know, but, you know, from a male perspective, um, I, there are men who, uh, as, as young men will say, um, they have the capacity to express themselves in certain ways, but they choose not to because they just don't feel like it, you know. Uh, there are men like that, but normally there's something underlying that. Normally right. there's something, some issue they're dealing with, you know, fear of intimacy, fear of, of you name it, you know. Those guys probably should have a brother that they visit with and, and have a little heart to heart and start asking the Lord, why is it that I'm this way? That I can't really go into, you know. But um, I, I think that we all do things we don't really want to. And it could be even the most mundane things. I've shared this before, uh, where um, you know you, you couldn't really have paid me, though I did get paid to do this once. I had to it was my job description, but in fact, you really can't pay me to clean up vomit. You you, you can't, can you? You know, hey, I, I'm gonna write down an application. I'd like to be the vomit cleaner upper, <laughs> right? I mean, you don't do that, right? Um, it has to be either chunky vomit or well, let's not get graphic, my friend. <laughs> So with that, with that, um, but you have babies and those babies get sick and what I wouldn't do for money, I did for love. You know, I made a choice to mm -hmm. go and, and, and not to say that I was, no, Marie was a, a, a great attentive mother, great attentive grandmother. No, I, it wasn't like I had to push her out of the way, you know, or anything. Oh, I've got, no, I, but I did. But I did clean the babies. I would change their diapers when, when, when it needs to be done, it needs to be done. I didn't see it as woman's work or man's work. It, it's something that needs to be done. But if you'd asked me, do you ever want to clean up a diaper or do you ever want to clean up, you know, beds that have been messed up because the baby's sick and vomited? No. Do you want to do that? No, of course not. Then why did you do it? Why do you do that? Because you love. Mm -hmm. There are things you do out of love that you could never get paid to do. That's a great illustration. You know, it's true. And and so, yeah, and, and I think that sometimes if a husband's tired and all, but the wife is saying, um, honey, I'd like to be intimate. I feel I need your arms around me or whatever she might say. He may not feel like it, um, but if he's able and and she wants him, uh, I think, I think he, he, he owes her due benevolence, I do. And the, the opposite, obviously, is true. That's great insight because, uh, again, the rendering is more, it, it's multifaceted, right? It, it means the affection, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional. And again, it's one of those things where you guys mentioned dying to ourselves in order to render is so important. And uh, I meet with couples and I see that a key thing that, you know, I'm not going to do that or... I'm going to hold out because, and it's almost like a, uh, a one-up on each other. Yeah, they punish. They pun yeah, it's a punishment exactly. thing. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because you see that going on, and it's that's not what marriage was designed for. It was designed for one another under the covering. That's why I was asking about the cluttering, the things that can really clutter our marriages. 
you know, I think of a garage that's cluttered, you know, and mm -hmm. you can't get mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. So many mm -hmm. boxes and so many things have mm -hmm. been accumulated over years mm -hmm. that can clutter our marriages and, and, uh, and children so, do. Yo, <laughs> children yeah. do. You know, children do. And I don't think it's an ugly clutter by any means, but children most definitely do. And, and uh, I had to, I had to deal with that. You know, I was taught in, in college when I was taking my courses. And uh, I think we may have had uh, Corinne already, you know, but uh, I was taught in, in my class, they said, hus they said fathers will get jealous. They get jealous of the child. And I, and I theoretically, you know, prior to having the baby, theoretically, I said, how is that possible? Really? Come on. That's my baby. Why would I be jealous? I thought the same thing. Right? <laughs> right. And then, then she shows more attention to the child. She doesn't have attention to you. You know, you feel kind of left out of her, her, her life. You know, the baby's got more time with the mother than I do. And I, I started realizing that's true. So there has to be prioritizing. There has to be conversation. There has mm -hmm. to be, you know, baby doll, I feel like we need to get away. Just you and me. Well, I don't want to. Marie and I did not go out on a date um, when Corinne was born until she was probably six months old. Probably. We were in the house for six months and and doing nothing. You know, I went to school, I guess, and, and, and all, and, I, and work. And, and John, I went crazy, and I really did. <laughs> and, I, and I told Maria, I said, uh, we gotta get out of this house. And so we finally, I think Crinny was about six months old. You'll remember as I say this, Robert, your brother, babysat her. Mm -hmm. And so we went off to a restaurant, maybe 20 minutes or so away from where we uh, lived. And Robert, my brother-in-law, you know, took care of Corinne. I still remember Marie and me at a restaurant looking at each other after we finished. We, I don't even know if we were yet finished with the meal. And I said, I miss my baby. How about you? <laughs> she says, yeah. I said, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. So we and rushed to go get our baby, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So we had to actually learn to make time for each other. And I had to learn to let a mama be a mama. Let this woman love her babies because it's only a blessing for them and for us. Instead of being jealous and possessive, we've got to take a week and you, your mother can watch the babies. We never did that. We never did that. Why? Because we valued them you know, and they made us who we are. And we just never had that. We still to this day, you know, when the kids were small, you know, we would say, you know, you've got a 20 minute rule. You can only stay 20 minutes from us so that, uh, you know, and it was my rule for them. But I've imposed that on myself now that my <laughs> children are older. And I've told Marie, I said, we can't, we can't live 20 minutes, more than 20 minutes away from them mm -hmm. because I want to see my my babies, of course, but we want to see our our grandbabies, you know. And so, that's all a matter of decisions. Right. It's all a matter of prioritizing. And children can clutter you. And if you if you don't, so Marie and I, now I mean our babies don't live with us anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we will get coffee pretty much every day. We spend time with each other mm -hmm. all the time, and. And uh, there's there's a there's a song by Boz Skaggs called "We're We're We're All Alone." You know, it's one of my songs with Marie, because I understand this just us kind of thing, because because uh, to me that's that's what I want, but um, we've got to have room for the babies now. But when you're young, you have to prioritize. You have to make room for each other you even if it's even if it's um when the babies go to bed and you you know you sit there for a half hour an hour um and visit you know or it, even when you go to bed and and just before you go to sleep you just have that pillow talk where you just say baby how was your day how things you know you got to do that mm -hmm. every day and that's what marie and marie and i have done uh for a long time. Because if you're not mindful of that, not only will it create clutter, it'll create distance. Absolutely. And then if you get that roommate syndrome mentality, you know. You become a brother and a sister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, when that happens, be careful. 
-hmm. Well, there'll be somebody out there who's mm -hmm. who's drawing your attention. Mm -hmm. We'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. There always is. I've 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 always been aware with that with Marie, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that that and the God, the Lord taught me that. I mean, I, I can say it as the Lord taught me that. He said to me, if you don't show her attention, somebody else will. There's always that that Jody. We call them in Jody in the army. You know, Jody's got your girl and gone. You know, or the Sancho. You know, I think in in the Marine Corps, or Sancho. But we had Jody, and Jody's got your girl. You know, there's always a guy looking at your girl. This guy before Marie and I got married, I had we oh. broke up. We broke up. You know, I took my uh, engagement ring back. I took her ring back. I said, "Man, I feel too much pressure." Uh, I'm not ready to get married. I said, I'm not ready. So, you know, I cried. I took the ring back. I said, Marie, I, I, I'm, I'll give it to you when we get married, but I'm not gonna have this waiting because I'm not ready. My mind's not ready. And she hands me the ring. I remember crying in the parking lot there at, at where she was living and I felt horrible, John. I felt so bad, but Marie's smart. <laughs> Because within, <laughs> within a week, within a week, she's talking to me, and she says, "You know this guy? There's this um, there's this um, sandwich shop there by where I work." <laughs> I said, "Oh," and she goes, "Yeah." I said, and she says, and I, she says, "Yeah, I went there to eat lunch with some of the girls." And I said, "Really?" She goes, "Yeah." And she says, "There's a guy that I, I noticed I don't have an engagement ring on anymore," <laughs> and asked me if I um, no longer engaged. I said, really? And she goes, yeah. Yeah. I say, he's showing interest in you, huh? You know, and I'm acting like it doesn't matter. I said, <laughs> she goes, yes, I guess he is. And so the next day I took her to lunch. <laughs> Same place? At the place. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and I stood there staring She's at mine, him. mine, right? Yeah, I stood there staring at him like, <laughs> I'm still in the picture. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. Oh, wow. And about what, honey? About a week later, we were married. It wasn't more than a couple of weeks. <laughs> it couple it weeks, was more than a couple that's weeks, right? That's yeah. good strategy. Huh? <laughs> she knew what she was doing. <laughs> she just, she just, just poked me in the right place. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> yeah, she said, you remember that? No, it's, that's a true story. That's wow. a true story. Oh, yeah, that is wow, true. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a funny story though. Yeah. No, she's there getting her sandwich, and I was had my arms folded. I'm <laughs> just looking at this guy. <laughs> meat, your response? dead meat. <laughs> What was his response? He wouldn't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't look at me. I, I remember just looking at him. <laughs> was, but I, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no fighter. God knows that. But th th this is mine. <laughs> you're not going to take not it. Right. You're, not, you're not going to have this. <laughs> How stupid is oh, that? Oh, that's, a, that's it's a true story. That's yeah, it is. So you guys have given us practical, practical things about guarding against cluttering the things that can clutter our marriage. And so I'm thankful that you're able to keep us, keep it in a practical sense where we want to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to land in our marriages. And so I want to thank you for being transparent and thank you for really giving us some great insight. And so thank you guys so much. Amen, John. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks again for tuning in. Let's Talk Marriage is a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. If you enjoyed this video, then please like and share it. We will see you again next week on another episode of Let's Talk Marriage.